This is lesson 12.1, Wealth and Power in Renaissance Italy. And I always like to start off with where we are getting these questions. Our questions from the textbook is how did politics and economics shape the Renaissance? But I think the more important thing is questions from College Board, because they're the ones that make the test. And if you look at the, the course and exam description, um, what we've got here is several things. College Board 1.1, contextualizing Renaissance and discovery. And when they say discovery, they mean the age of discovery, ships and caravels and Columbus and all that stuff that we're going to study. And it says, explain the context. Contextualization is a thinking skill in which the Renaissance and the age of discovery developed. And what they, the point they want to make is this. European society and the experiences of everyday life were increasingly shaped by commercial and agricultural capitalism, notwithstanding the continued existence of medieval social and economic structures. So you've got some change right there, see? But you've also got some stuff say, staying the same, right? Change and continuity. So the economic change produced, a, produced new social patterns while the traditions of hierarchy and status continued. And we're going to see hierarchy and status and privilege really throughout our entire course. College Board 1.2, the Italian Renaissance. Explain the political, intellectual, and cultural effects of the Italian Renaissance. Admiration for Greek and Roman political institutions supported a revival of civic humanist culture. All those words are very important. In the Italian city-states and produced secular models for individual and political behavior. And topic 1.5, we're going to talk about new monarchies, explain the causes and effects of the development of political institutions from 1450 to 1648. And it says, across Europe, commercial and professional groups gained in power and played a greater role in political affairs. And continued political fragmentation in Renaissance Italy provided a background for the development of new concepts of the secular state. Now, I know that these things don't mean a lot to you going into this. They sound pretty wordy. But go through this, and when we learn this, come back to this and look at these again. It'll be like reading something entirely new. So let's get into the actual story of what we're talking about. Renaissance Italy. Don't need any of that. So here's my introduction. It, 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 this will mean much more to you, to you if you did the summer reading that was in that particular Google Classroom that we did over the summer about the, the, the late Middle Ages. But what we want to say about the Renaissance is this. It was a process that had human intention behind it. That's different from what went on before. In the late Middle Ages, nobody said, let's have a black death, and that'll transform society to look like such and such. Nobody said, hey, let's have a hundred years war, and that's going to transform society to look like such and such. And nobody said, hey, let's have a great papal schism, and that's going to transform society to look like such and such, and such. At that time, with all those things happening, people were just trying to survive or trying to make a living or trying to win a battle, etc., but the Renaissance was different. The Renaissance was not like that. Yes, we can identify geographical and religious and political and economic and social factors that made the Renaissance possible and provided a context in which that could happen. And yes, there were geographical, religious, political, economic, and social forces that pulled the Renaissance along. But what made it different was you also had a collection of people many of whom, whose names we know, who had a very clear idea of the kind of society that they were trying to create, and they worked at it consciously and deliberately. In the, our previous summer readings, we saw how crisis, disease, and war had undermined the values and the notions of the Middle Ages. And to many people, the world seemed old and tired and used up and dead. Maybe you have felt this way about the world today. You know, we, we've got, uh, uh, we live in a time of 
pollution and erosion and global warming and depleted resources and fires and disease. And maybe you feel like our world is used up and old and tired. That's how these people felt near the end at the, the end of the Middle Ages. Old assumptions and old ways didn't seem to work anymore. And Europeans, this is the lesson we need to learn. Europeans might have responded with just more pessimism, but they didn't. Instead, they responded with a new outlook and a new optimism. And that outlook and that optimism could be available to us today. And that's why we're learning about this. And this new paradigm has been called humanism. And if you don't know what humanism is, don't worry. It's my job to make that crystal clear to you. And humanism was a pillar of the Renaissance. The Renaissance and humanism, it was a revival and a renewal and a rebirth of society into something that seemed fresh and new, not old and tired and used up and dead. Decades of corruption and disaster and decay like people were living through in the late Middle Ages makes people hark back to, quote, the good old days when everything seemed so much better. And for many European intellectuals of the late Middle Ages, the good old days were defined as classical Rome and Greece. And this, this explains part of the desire to bring the classics of antiquity, the ancients, into modern thought. The thought was, wouldn't it be great if we could just return to those days to literally remake this world in the image of antiquity, in the image of what they had back then. The Renaissance was not an accident of fate. Yeah, you could say that there were political and social and economic factors that favored the Renaissance, first in Italy and then throughout Europe. Or you could also say that the Renaissance came about because there was a political and a social and an economic need for it. That either way, you had many human beings who had a similar vision for the kind of society they wanted to create, and they consciously set out to make that society. The Renaissance was a combination of old and new. It wasn't really an effort to get back to yesterday. Instead, it was about using yesterday to create something that was entirely fresh and vibrant. How were they going to accomplish this new society? Two things. Number one, by rediscovering and rereading the writings of those classical authors that you had back in Rome and Greece. And number two, by creating a new, revolutionary, new kind of education. One that was broader, one that was more flexible, and dare I say it, it's not here on the screen, but one that was more practical. What ideas drove this renaissance? Well, we're going to see some of those ideas right here in this presentation, in this video, but we're going to see many more of these ideas in the next presentation. In the next three PowerPoints, you're going to experience the story of the Renaissance three different times from three different perspectives. First, in this one, we're going to get an economic, social, and political story of the Renaissance, and that's wealth and power. Then we're going to go back, and we're going to get an intellectual story of the Renaissance, intellectual change. change. And then finally, we're going to go back one more time and get the part that you always associate with the Renaissance, and that's the art. We're going to get an artistic story of the Renaissance. And each one of these various perspectives put together, it's incomplete by itself, but together they will give us a pretty good picture of what the Renaissance was and why it happened and what its impact was. First, first question, why did the Renaissance begin in Italy, of all places. Well, number one, you had a geographical reason. You can see the map right here. Italy is a peninsula sticking out deep into the Mediterranean Sea, and this gave Italy easy access to markets all over the Mediterranean. And this facilitated trade and wealth from that trade. You also had economic reasons. 
Northern Italy had a large concentration of commercial wealth that it had gained through trade and through industry. Trade and industry also gave rise to banking. Italy was the first place in Europe to emerge from those crises that we learned about back in the summer reading, like the Hundred Years' War and the, the Great Papal Schism and, um, and the Plague. Money was available to invest in things like art, culture, and learning. Here's a principle you should remember. If there's no money, then we have no renaissance to talk about. There were social reasons. Northern Italy was highly urbanized and dominated by numerous large cities. Northern Italian life was largely urban life, and this was very, very different from the rest of Europe. In Italy, even rural places were controlled by cities, and the societies of ancient Greece and Rome had also been quite urban. And this meant this. It meant that pre-Renaissance Italy actually had more in common with, with ancient Greece and Rome than it had with the rest of Europe in its own time. And let's face it, when you are looking for answers to your problems, you're going to look to people who seem to be more like you. Trade and prosperity. Economic, social, and political reasons. Florence, the city of Florence's economy was all about wool and cloth, and Florence is where it all begins. About a third of the population of the city of Florence was directly involved in the production and trade of woolen cloth, and the need to finance the woolen cloth industry gave rise to an extensive and sophisticated Europe-wide banking system. Bankers made up the highest of the various woolen cloth guilds of Florence. Florence had about 80 different banks, and these 80 banks had about 300 branch offices all over Europe. They could even do bills of exchange between branches. If you were making a, a trade and you were traveling from Florence all the way to England, and you, you didn't have to carry cash with you. Of course, you'd probably get attacked and killed if you, and the cash taken. You didn't have to do that. didn't have to worry about that. You simply went to the branch bank in England and with your bill of exchange and got the cash that way. The entire woolen cloth industry was divided up into a hierarchy of guilds. And we talked about guilds in the summer reading. There were major guilds, seven of them to be specific, and there were many minor guilds. There were separate guilds for the bankers, separate guilds for the merchants and the fullers and the softeners and the dyers and the washers and the menders and the cutters. Every little aspect of the wool operation had its own guild. The highest and wealthiest guilds in Florence, called the Great Guilds, slowly began to dominate the political life of the city. And the Great Guilds were dominated by certain wealthy families. So certain wealthy families, therefore, make the connection, dominated political life in Florence through their positions of dominance in their great guilds. I love this picture because here's a procession going through Florence and you've got all of these various guild members wearing their guild uniforms very proudly, proudly and their guild banners. Guilds, the guild you belong to was a big deal, big part of your life. The city council in Florence, which consisted of all the various administrative positions of power, you know, the police and the commerce and taxation and the foreign affairs and the mayors and the selection of judges, etc. That city council was called the Signoria. And you had to be a member of one of the great guilds to be eligible to serve in the Signoria. Appointments were made for very short periods of time. And we'll talk about why in a minute. So because of that, because appointments were so short, there was lots of room for civic participation among many people. Appointments to the Signoria were made through a process called the scrutiny. A committee would start off with a list of eligible persons from all the seven 
great guilds. And then that committee would start striking off names of people who couldn't serve. Maybe they were sick, or maybe they were in too much debt, or maybe they were out of town. Maybe they were in exile. Maybe they were dead. And so once all of this crossing off was finished, you had a new list of names. And then a second, more scrutinizing committee would strike off more names. And this produced a list, a final list of nominees. And the name of each nominee was written on a bean. And then the beans were put into a chest and drawn out by a blindfolded committee member. And that's how the positions in the Signoria were filled. That's the scrutiny. And if you're a wealthy merchant, and if you can get your friends on that committee to strike off the names of people who aren't your friends, you run the entire city from behind the scenes without ever holding public office. And best of all, you can maintain the illusion that your city is a republic and not some kind of oligarchy. Now, when you put all these together and you count the council, the signoria, and the council of the commune, and the council of the popolo, those are three sources of representation. Power was spread out among 1,165 men in Florence over the course of a year. Policy making in Florence was done by a two house, kind of like our Senate. Or like our Congress, a two-house representative body, and it had a total combined membership of about 500 members. You know, our Congress has, what, 535? And these two houses were known as the Council of the Commune and the Council of the Popolo. And by the way, the word popolo means people. That's where you get words like population and popular. So both of these councils were led and represented by a chancellor. And this was a position which became very powerful over time. So the chancellor was kind of like what we would call a prime minister today. And the chancellor had to be highly educated and have very good command of Latin. And chancellors tended to be humanists. And when I say humanists and you're like, I don't know what that is, don't worry. We'll get into that in detail soon. Two of the greatest of these chancellors were Caluccio Salutati, and Leonardo Bruni, Salutati's protege. Communes and republics. This is kind of the political reason for the Renaissance. Northern Italy had a culture that was fascinated by politics. You know, other places in Europe had a general disdain for politics. Landed feudal noblemen in other parts of Europe, they didn't want their subjects to have an interest in politics. And the church, the church pretended to be above politics. In northern Italy, the widespread participation in the political life of the city was seen as a good thing. And you saw how, over the course of a year, the leadership of Florence would involve about 1,165 people. And so it was seen as being good for the community. It was seen as being good for the individual person's development. And political power in Florence had a lot of participation. Widespread participation led to widespread civic pride. And so more people wanted to learn how to get better at politics. They wanted to be more educated. They wanted to communicate better. And that was a unique thing about Northern Italy. There was no king or nobility. It was run by the wealthy middle class. And it was what we call a commune. Why did it have no nobility? Well, in the late 1200s, the guilds of Florence had con actually gotten laws passed to exclude the local nobles from city government and eventually got those nobles banned from the city completely. The nobles of, of Florence were useless and disruptive as civic participants. They had no interest in the city's economic success. They feuded with each other constantly, and they brought chaos and havoc to the life and commerce of the city. Have you, do you remember uh, Romeo and Juliet? How did the play Romeo and Juliet start? With a massive battle in the middle of town between two feuding noble families. Remember that? This is what I'm talking about. So where did this mass interest in politics come from? 
It came from crisis. Northern Italy was made up of independent city-states, and these were called communes. Communes were towns that wanted to get out from under domination by the nobles, and wealthy guilds led this effort. Florence was a commune. Originally, these communes had been fairly inclusive government-wise, political-wise. The common people, called the popolo, even, as we saw, had their own representative body. And these independent city-states often competed against each other through warfare. And they often had to defend themselves against foreign invaders like France and Spain and the Holy Roman Empire. And many city-states got caught up in disputes between the Pope and the Holy Roman Empire over issues of authority. Locally, as the higher guilds became more powerful, leadership of these communes became more and more exclusive, cutting more and more people out of representation. And the Popolo, they resented this exclusion, which they saw as a departure from the original idea behind the commune. And this caused a lot of political instability. And some Popolos even rebelled and took over their city government for short periods. In the summer reading, we learned about the Chiampi Revolt that took over Florence and ran it from 1378 to 1382. Sometimes political instability would arise if a war wasn't going well. Florence experimented with an emergency measure called the Condittieri, and that's actually a type of person if there's total lawlessness and you can't get the city of, under control, what you do is this. You hire a strong man from outside to come in with his own military force, smash a few heads together, and restore order. And such strong men were called condittieri. In short, these were temporarily hired dictators. And you wanted outsiders to come and serve as condittieri who would do the job, take their money, and then leave. Florence tried it once in the year 1310. The Condottiero was the king of Naples, and the emergency was an invasion by Henry VII of the Holy Roman Empire. And the experiment worked perfectly. Florence tried it again in 1320. The Condottiero this time was Charles of Calabria, and the emergency was this. Florence was doing really badly in a war against another town called Lucca, and they were doing so bad that it was causing riots in their streets. They hired Charles of Calabria. They, he came in, smashed a few heads, restored order. They paid him his money. He left. It worked again perfectly. Then the Florentines turned to, to a condittiero a third time in the 1340s. This time, the condottiero was Walter of Brienne, and the emergency was this. Edward III of England had refused to pay back loans that he had borrowed from Florence's two biggest banks. He defaulted. And as a result of this default, all of Europe plunged into an economic meltdown causing riots and lawlessness throughout Florence. But this time, the condottiero, Walter of Brienne, came in, smashed a few heads, restored order, completed the job, and then didn't want to leave. And so he became what is called a signoro. And a signoro is a permanent one-man ruler. And to get him kicked out, it took a bloody civil war that knocked Walter Brienne out of power. Well, after that, the Florentines had a healthy fear of dictatorships. They didn't you know, want, want to get burned again like they got burned with Walter of Brienne. And hence, the practice of spreading out power among a large number of leaders. Hence, the very short terms in office that we talked about, so that no one leader has time to consolidate too much power. He's not in office long enough. Hence, greater general involvement in civic leadership, because you need more people, right? Hence, a diffusion of civic pride among all these people who have now a greater stake in the politics of the city. And hence, a mass hunger to learn 
as much as possible about the art of politics and civic leadership. City-states and the balance of power. You can kind of pin down the birth of the Renaissance to a specific time and a specific place, and that is this. The city of Florence, sometime between 1382 and 1402. The Chiampi, that lower guild workers' party, had ruled Florence since their takeover of the city four years earlier. And in 1382, the patricians, the, and the patricians are these wealthy, greater guild guys, took power back. How did they do it? How did they get rid of these the, the Chiapi? Well, they staged a lockout of their businesses. And if you don't know what a lockout is, it's kind of like the inverse of a strike. You know, in a strike, the workers all des- you know, uh, decide to uh, team up and refuse to work. Well, in a lockout, the bosses lock their businesses and don't let the workers work. So the workers couldn't work, and so they couldn't feed their families. And so because of that, the Chiapi lost popular support, and their government collapsed, and the patricians were back on top. The wealthy and powerful Albizzi family ruled, and I put that in there, you know, in quotations, ruled over Florence from 1382 to 1434. And they exercised power by manipulating that scrutiny process that we talked about, you know, where the names are scratched off the list. So Florence flourished as a republic, although power was significantly less spread out among the people than it had been under the Chiampi guilds. And Coluccio Salutati and Leonardo Bruni were chancellors during this time. And it's under the Albizzi leadership and patronage, and we'll talk about what patronage is also, that the Renaissance really takes off. In the year 1402, Gian Galeazzo Visconti, the Duke of Milan, was besieging the city of Florence with a much larger army. Love this story. Visconti ruled the Duchy of Milan as a dictator, and the Florentine Chancellor Coluccio Salutati and his young protege, Leonardo Bruni, rallied the people of Florence against the besiegers. And Salutati characterized this struggle to his people, not just as a struggle of one power against another, not just one city against another city, but it was a struggle of a Republican government in Florence against a cruel and evil dictatorship. Nevertheless, the army of Milan, Visconti's army, was too powerful, and there seemed to be no way that Florence was going to survive this crisis. And at the last moment, Visconti died of the plague, and Visconti's army was shattered, and the city of Florence was saved. And Salutati and Bruni and some others got together to reflect upon what had happened. Why was Florence almost taken out by the Duke of Milan? Why didn't the people of Florence deal with this crisis better? And what could be done in the future to prevent this kind of crisis from happening again? And they determined that the educational system was the problem. The educational system had not prepared the city's leaders to deal with this crisis. And Salutati and Bruni and a few others designed a new educational system that would better prepare people for their civic roles in the city. And this new educational system was to be called civic humanism. Now, don't worry if you don't know what humanism or its subcomponent um, civic humanism actually is. This will be fully explained in the next presentation. For now, just know this, right? Today, in this day and age, in, tw- in, in the year 2020, Salutati and Bruni are considered the fathers of civic humanism. I love this picture of Leonardo Bruni shining the light of education on the city of Florence. Humanism and civic humanism are inseparable parts of this movement that we call the Renaissance. Without this pillar of the Renaissance called humanism, you don't have a Renaissance. Well, in 1425, 
Florence got into another very long war with Milan. And this time they weren't conquered either. They weren't conquered, but they also didn't win. And as a result, the Albizzi eventually fell from power as a result of losing this war. And in 1434, a powerful banker named Cosimo de' Medici took control over the city of Florence. How did he do it? Interesting. What It's almost kind of like um, malware. You know these malware people that, that infect your computer and then make you pay for them to fix it? It's like that. He orchestrated a riot in the city. And then he sent his own personal army into the city to quell the riot that he himself had started. And this army was led by his private general and good friend, Francesco Sforza. If there was any trouble, Sforza was there to take care of it. And Cosimo di Medici became known as the father of his country, that country being the city of Florence. Cosimo di Medici never once, never once in his entire career, held public office. And yet he ruled Florence through his masterful manipulation of that election process that we talked about. And be, perhaps the Renaissance could have ended here, but instead, with the arrival of the Medicis, it flourished even more. Cosimo became a huge and powerful patron, and a patron is a financial supporter and a, and a consumer and a customer of Renaissance art, Renaissance culture, Renaissance scholarship. And Cosimo ran Florence from behind the scenes from 1434 to 1464, 30 years. Some historians claim that Cosimo de' Medici was a tyrant. Some say that Cosimo de' Medici only supported the Renaissance in order, in order to mask his own despotism. But consider this, Cosimo never changed the Florence Republican government structure at all. He never made arbitrary policy de decisions just based on his mood or his own whims. Instead, his decisions were well thought out and well conceived. Cosimo worked hard to foster peace in Italy. And Cosimo's support for Renaissance art and culture and learning seems to have been very sincere. In 1447, the Duke of Milan died with no heir. And so Cosimo de' Medici managed to have his friend, his general, Francesco Sforza, put in charge of Milan. And then he immediately signed a, a peace treaty with him. So they assigned a peace treaty with each other. Of course, they're friends. Cosimo de' Medici made a major contribution of his very own to civic humanism, which was a pillar of the Renaissance. And that was this, balance of power theory. You've probably heard of it. The very powerful papal states in Italy uh, had formed a power block which threatened the city of uh, Florence, the papal states and Naples. And so what could Florence do to discourage this powerful alliance between the papal states and Naples from attacking them? Well, here's what they did. In 1454, under Cosimo de' Medici's leadership, Florence, Milan, Venice, and some other minor cities signed the Treaty of Lodi. And the peace of Lodi that resulted from that treaty would bring four decades of peace. The Treaty of Lodi was designed specifically as a way to create a balance of power among its signers that would offset the powerful alliance between the Papal States and the Kingdom of Naples. And this balance of power theory says this, if you want to discourage a powerful adversary or a powerful alliance from dominating its neighbors, you, then you need to create an alliance that has enough power to equal and offset that of your adversary. And today, this is Geopolitics 101. Cosimo de' Medici was succeeded by a son named Piero de' Medici, whom we don't have to worry about because he's not important. Cosimo's grandson, however, was Lorenzo de' Medici, also known as Lorenzo the Magnificent. And he ruled Florence from 1469 
1492. And he was another tremendous patron of Renaissance culture and Renaissance art and learning. And he presided over what we call the Golden Age of the Renaissance. Lorenzo the Magnificent, like his grandfather Cosimo, was a contributor to the Renaissance, as well as a patron. His big contribution to civic humanism was the idea of, and you've all heard of it, the resident ambassador. See, before uh, Lorenzo, if you wanted to communicate with another government, like in another city, then you had to send a special envoy to go and deliver the message. But Lorenzo de' Medici's idea was this. Why not have your ambassadors reside in these other cities? See, then they could be in constant communication with these other cities to ensure the peace. And they could be constantly working to promote and protect your city's interests in these other places. And soon, other cities were doing the exact same thing that he was doing. Well, the good times all fell apart after Lorenzo de' Medici died. Wealthy, prosperous, cultured, independent cities make tempting targets for people who want to loot them and rob them. And in 1494, Charles VIII of France decided that he was the rightful heir to the throne of Naples. Charles VIII had a very kind of remote claim to the throne that he could try to push. But Pope Innocent VIII offered Charles VIII the throne of Naples because he was mad at Naples' king for refusing to pay papal dues. And so Charles VIII's invasion of Italy was so fast and so powerful that Florence had to scramble to make peace with him. And the city of Florence exiled the Medici family in order to get a peace deal with Charles VIII. And you got a picture right here of Charles VIII entering the city of Florence without any resistance at all. And so uh, he's entering without a fight, and he's being welcomed by the city of Florence as a liberator from that awful, corrupt Medici family. Charles VIII actually left the city of Florence in disorder and rebellion. And a radical friar named Girolamo, Girolamo Savonarola had prophesied to the people of Florence, he had predicted that this invasion was going to happen to them. And Savonarola took advantage of the fact that he had been right. And he took control over the city of Florence. And he told the people of Florence, the Florentines, exactly what had caused this mis misfortune. The Renaissance. Yeah. All of this Renaissance art and literature and culture and learning and humanism and luxury had made the people of Florence soft and decadent and sinful. And Savonarola preached that the people of Florence had to get back to the straight and narrow path of strict obedience to God. Savonarola had huge numbers of Renaissance books and other decadent items brought to the city square and burned. And here's what he called these burnings. This is a list of synonyms for the word vanity. Here's a list. Conceit, narcissism, self-love, self-admiration, self-absorption, self-regard, egotism, pride, arrogance, futility, uselessness, pointlessness, worthlessness, fruitlessness. The Renaissance was all of these to Savonarola. Savonarola called his massive burnings of Renaissance items bonfires of the vanities. You may have heard that term. Well, Savonarola's reign didn't last long. Savonarola accused the church of nurturing corruption. And the Pope actually offered to make Savonarola a cardinal in order to appease him, but he contemptuously refused. Uh, Savonarola even refused to answer a papal summons to come to Rome and and uh, and explain himself. And Savonarola actually declared the Pope to be a heretic. And he called upon the whole of Christendom to rebel against the papacy. Well, the Pope isn't going to stand for that, and he sent forces north to eject Savonarola from power in Florence. And Savonarola was tortured and given the opportunity to repent before being burned at the stake. 
Savonarola may have believed that God would show his approval of Savonarola's teaching by not letting the flames touch him. He was wrong. It didn't work. Here's a picture of him being burned right there on the city square. Some historians maintain that Savonarola's reign marked the end of the Renaissance in Florence. Savonarola was replaced in 1498 by a republic again. The chancellor was Piero Soderini, and Soderini's right-hand man was the second chancellor. Um, was none other than, of all people, Niccolo Machiavelli himself. We will learn a lot more about him soon, and maybe you've heard of the name Machiavelli. Well, in 1512, the Medici family came back to Florence, and this time they came back as Dukes of Florence, and they kicked Soderini and Machiavelli out of power. The Medici family had the aid of the city of patricians, and these patricians felt that Soderini's republic was too inclusive towards the lower classes. So Florence was no longer a, a republic anymore. But was this the end of the Renaissance in Florence? In the year 1513, Machiavelli wrote the Renaissance classic, The Prince. He hoped it would land him a job, actually, with the ruling Medici family. The Prince is universally accepted as a Renaissance work by a universally accepted Renaissance figure. But Machiavelli wrote The Prince 15 years after Savonarola's death. And this would indicate that the end of Florence as a republic was not the end of the Renaissance.